thousands of tens of millions of dollars, launder it, clean it up, and use the cover of a state agency to do it. The first loan made at ADFA was made to Parkometer, a company called Parkometer. Seth Ward was the owner. As I started looking, I found out that the secretary treasurer was Webb Hubble. Then I find out Webb Hubble was Seth Ward's son-in-law. Guess who drafted the legislation creating Act 1062, which created the Arkansas Development Finance Authority? Webb Hubble. Guess who introduced the legislation to our legislators and got it passed through our house? Webb Hubble. Guess who got the first loan? Webb Hubble. Imagine this. Guess who did the audit and the evaluation of the application? Rose Law Firm, you guessed it. Who signed it? Webb Hubble, Hillary Clinton. You see, that's against the law in Arkansas. You can't investigate yourself when the good faith and credit of the state of Arkansas is involved in a bond issue. He broke the law. Good Lord willing, Creek don't rise. Mr. Hubble will be serving some time in the pen for that one. Ironically, Webb Hubble, a senior partner at the Rose Law Firm, was chairman of the Conflicts of Interest Committee at Rose. In 1988, he successfully advanced the Ethics in Government Act, which required Arkansas legislators to report governmental conflicts of interest. Incredibly, this law specifically exempted Governor Bill Clinton, his appointees, and his relatives. Clinton's appointment of Hubble to the U.S. Justice Department exemplified the administration's total disregard for legal ethics. Hubble's hasty resignation in March 1994 for overbilling of Rose clients was merely a ploy to remove Hubble from the limelight before extensive criminal charges could be brought against him. Let me tell you about Parkometer. The first loan was $2.85 million. Never was a penny of that payback. As the newspaper people started inquiring about the Parkometer loans, what they found was that Parkometer was actually building retrofit nose cone compartments that were being shipped to Mena. We find out that the nose cones were actually being used to smuggle dope back into the country. And what is scary, what's so scary, it's the same cast of characters. Webb Hubble, the Rose Law Firm, are guilty, I say to you, of conspiring to defraud the state of Arkansas, the federal government, and conspired to solicit the sales and the laundering of money for illegal drugs. This is your president. This is his circle of power. These are the people, when he got elected president, he did not pass go, he took them straight to Washington with him. And by all things holy. I think he was planning to set up and do the same thing in Washington. In 1982, cocaine trafficker Barry Seal set up one of the largest drug smuggling operations in the United States in Mena, Arkansas, under the approving eye of Governor Bill Clinton. Barry Seal had a bunch of planes and supposedly had pilots. Barry Seal was a, was a drug smuggler. Now, he tried to set it up in his home state of Louisiana. But they wouldn't let him. He had to come to a state that had a sleazy governor hooked on cocaine, and everybody knew it. Yeah, Bill Clinton was hooked on cocaine. I lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, okay? And uh, I worked at a cup called La, Bist La Bistro's, and I met Roger Clinton there, uh, Governor Bill Clinton. Um, so a couple of the state troopers that went with him wherever he went, Roger Clinton uh, had came up to me and he had asked me, could I get him some coke, you know, and ask for my one hitter, which a one hitter is a very small silver device, okay, that you stick up into your nose and you just squeeze it and it, a snort of cocaine will go up in there. And uh, I watched um, Roger hand what I had Gave, given him to um, Governor Clinton, and he just kind of turned around and 
walked off, and that's one specific. Dr. Suen, uh, S-U-E-N, a uh, doctor at the medical center here in Little Rock, has taken care of Bill Clinton for his sinus problems, which may indeed be drug-related to cocaine use um, as they destroy the sinus passages. Governor Bill Clinton was taken into the hospital, I believe it was the medical center, on at least one or two occasions for cocaine uh, abuse and overdosage in which he actually had to be cared for at the hospital. It led to um, toga parties. Uh, and if you're not sure on what a toga party is, I've had to clarify this in the past. A uh, toga party is where you wrap yourself in a sheet uh, most of the time. Uh, the people at the toga parties were um, Governor Clinton, now President Clinton, Attorney General um, Steve Clark, okay, he was there a few times, um, members of the Arkansas State Police, you know, along with Roger and, you know, other people. They began to dance around, do the cocaine in one room, have sex in another room, because in the Coachman's Inn, the rooms were adjoining, you know. And, uh, to be quite truthful, you end up with somebody in particular, and you nine times out of ten end up having sex. And uh, there, co there was cocaine there. I, I know. I'm, I'm the one that made sure it was there. I've talked to the manager, the assistant manager for the apartment complex where Roger Clinton used to live. They've all said Bill Clinton did drugs. They saw him. I've talked to a lot of other people who of all, just like the people at the apartment complex, said, hey, John, get us to a congressional hearing. Yes, we'll sign sworn affidavits. These people want to be sure when they come forward that something's done about it because they fear for their life, but they really want the truth to get out. I was there, we're coming there with Roger one night, and back in the um, back part of the mansion there, there's kind of like a living quarters type thing, and uh, we would all get together out there and um, do cocaine, you know. And uh, no, Miss Clinton wasn't there at the time. In uh, 1983, I was made aware that Sheriff Hathaway and one of his auxiliary deputies, Terry Capehart, were investigating a, uh, a smuggling operation going on at the Vienna Airport. They had a, an inside source of information. Mr. Seal, um, it was our understanding, was the one who had brought the operation into the main airport and that had initiated the beginning of the money laundering and the illegal activity. He said 1983 was his most profitable cocaine smuggling period ever. Uh, said that he, uh, the airplanes that he had placed at the main airport, there were four of them, a couple of Senecas and a couple of Panthers and one or two stragglers uh, here and there, different airplanes. He said they were uh, purchased solely for the purpose of cocaine smuggling. There was, in my opinion, more than enough evidence to prosecute a number of people for crimes regarding the Barry Seal case at Mena. I snuck around, crawled through the bushes, thinking that I'd really have to hide to see them unloading the dope. Didn't have to. You could walk right up to the airport and they'd unloaded it right in front of you. They would unload it. They'd offload it. They didn't care. Uh, a certain degree of money laundering had taken place uh, among these people that were associated with Barry Seal. What had not been done was to connect the dotted lines to ADFA. Because once you connected the dotted lines to ADFA, you had actually connected the dotted line to Clinton. In addition to the operations at MENA, small clearings in other parts of the state were used as drop points for money and cocaine. They had special uh, uh, cargo doors installed on the side without FAA permission uh, so that these uh, doors could be opened in flight. They'd uh, pull in, slide back, and, and the cocaine could be dropped out of the side in flight. When you have a public which is aware of an ongoing criminal enterprise, which, when you have an international cocaine smuggler who is high profile, and a lot of people know that they are operating in a small area. A lot of people knew about the money laundering. Uh, it was common gossip on the street because it was so blatant. 
and they see investigations ongoing for several years, and they keep watching for indictments. They know grand juries are convening. They know that witnesses are supposed to be providing evidence to a grand jury, yet year after year after year, no indictments are returned. People lose confidence in the system. Clinton had integrated a number of corrupt cops, judges, and politicians into high-level positions to ensure the continued success of the drug smuggling, money laundering operations. All was going well until a fateful night in the fall of 1987. On August 22nd, 1987, Kevin had spent the night with his friend Don Henry. They left uh, Don's home around 12.30 or quarter to one uh, on the 23rd of August in early morning hours, and uh, the next thing we knew, they had been run over by a train. There seems to be a small airstrip in the area. There have been sightings and uh, reports of small airplanes flying very low with lights off in the area. I believe they saw something they shouldn't have seen. Three weeks later, their deaths were ruled accidental by the state. Medical examiner Fami Malik and um, we disagreed with that ruling uh, because we thought the evidence pointed to homicide. Uh, at that point, we had a lot of questions and no answers, uh, and the facts didn't add up to what he was telling us, so we decided to get a second opinion and uh, met with resistance from all fronts, both with our local law enforcement, with the state crime lab, uh, with everybody that we turned to. Uh, we obtained court orders uh, we, requesting samples of everything that the crime lab had for a second opinion. And uh, Femi Malik um, uh, resisted court orders. Uh, he refused to obey them. Ultimately, it was proven that Don Henry had been stabbed in the back and Kevin Ives' skull had been crushed prior to the placement of their bodies on the railroad tracks. However, Malik stood by his ruling that the boys had simply fallen asleep on the tracks. Malik had been kept in office at the insistence of Governor Clinton for a number of years, despite vigorous public outcry to have him removed. As long as Malik's rulings pleased the governor's office or state police, they were left to stand, no matter how implausible. Malik's obvious lack of medical knowledge reached a pinnacle when he ruled that James Milam, who had been decapitated, had died of natural causes. Yet Clinton, who had the power to remove Malik from office, insisted he stay. There were allegations of tampering with evidence in murder cases. Uh, there were allegations of perjury in different cases. It didn't seem to matter what Malik did, Clinton uh, protected him. He made excuses such as he's overworked, uh, he's just stressed out. He's underpaid. Uh, they gave him a $14,000 raise, which was an insult uh, to my family as well as a lot of others in the state who um, to this day are struggling with asinine rulings in the deaths of children and other loved ones. I was outraged that protecting a political crony of Clinton's was more important than the fact that two young boys had been murdered. Dan Harmon was just a local attorney in, in the town of Benton, Arkansas. And uh, after Don Henry and Kevin Ives were killed and their bodies placed on the tracks and run over by a train, he approached Linda Ives and the Henry family about trying to help them. He's a manipulator. Gives a great closing argument in court. He's been trained for years to play the game. He knows how to do it. He's very good at it. Mr. Harmon can win your confidence and make you think he's the greatest guy in the world. He did that to Linda Ives. He helped lead them down a path that absolutely led to nowhere on this case. I got involved in the case and immediately Harmon uh, tried to discredit me without even knowing me couldn't figure it out. I run across a young lady named Charlene Wilson who told a horror story that I didn't really believe at the time. So 
so I started searching for evidence to substantiate just part of what she had said. Herman went ballistic. Uh, called, he threatened me, threatened Sheriff Pridgen, threatened Captain Gene Donham, the chief deputy. All because I talked to this one woman. The people at the track that night, to my knowledge, were Dan Harmon, Keith McCaskill, Larry Rochelle. I do know that the boys were watching the drop site, okay? And they got curious as to what was 